on your behavior, it's on your heart, it's on your DNA. Like, how do you, how do you deal with all that? Good evening. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, and little boys and girls that I saw running around a few minutes. My name is Dr. Valeta Jenkins Monroe, and I'm actually the proud president of the San Francisco chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. We are so delighted that you joined us, and thank you for coming. Chartered in 1950, we have served the African American community in San Francisco and the African diaspora for over 67 years through our transformational programs. With more than 40 active and alumni members, we partner with uh, community organizations, primarily in the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood, to further enrich their lives of the underserved. Tonight, we partner with Center for Youth Wellness Community Advisory uh, Council, better known as CAC, to preview a film followed by a discussion about physical and mental health and resiliency. We want to take the time to better understand how our children, adolescents, and families are thriving in today's world despite their many challenges they face. Critical in our understanding is to first acknowledge children's exposure to multiple traumatic events, which are considered invasive, interpersonal, and often disrupts their developmental and their formation of self. By definition, complex trauma is a variety of traumatic events that can involve physical and sexual abuse, domestic and community violence, separation from family members, and re-victimization by others. Across the lifespan, complex trauma is linked to a wide range of problems, including addiction, chronic physical conditions, depression and anxiety, self-harming behavior, and other psychological disorders. Though tonight, we want to continue the, a discussion that we hope are, is taking place all across the world, certainly within the United States. We want to foster positive relationships and t discuss resiliency as a response to um, the increasing capacity to deal with everyday uh, trauma. Thanks to all of you for your willingness to engage in ways to think about our stressors and trauma in our lives more from a strength-based perspective rather than looking at stressors from previously deficit models. Again, enjoy the show. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Belva Davis, an inspiration for professionals and aspiring journalists. Davis has reported on significant and historical events, not only in the Bay Area, but also throughout the country, and has interviewed several US presidents and other world leaders. She demonstrates her community involvement by being a broad member for community nonprofits, labor activists, and support of cultural institutions. Ms. Davis is also a proud member of the San Francisco chapter of the Lynx, having joined the organization in 1985. Ms. Davis. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Big question now is, can we do something about it? So we meet a star of the film, and we will ask her to join us first of all. And that is Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Please join us, Dr. Harris. She is the founder. She is the sound founder and the CEO, as you know, of the Center for Youth Wellness. Your number on your chair. I don't know. That's you. She is famous already because of what she has done. She doesn't have to wait to be discovered. You discovered her right here in her own community, and you made her by your cooperation, helping her to help you help yourself. So she is, uh, we are proud to have her on the stage with us. Also uh, with us is James Redford. 
James Redford, you name you, I hope you saw at the end of the film. He is the filmmaker. He himself is a person. <laughs> yeah, you go, James. That has made big pictures, important pictures like the one that we've just seen, and his work speaks for itself. Tiffany Johnson. <laughs> Tiffany Johnson is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Her interest spans many areas of student concerns as she continues her studies in the uh, equality and social justice program there. Her concern is for students, for students who are searching for hope, like you and me, students who are searching for love. She wants to take part in it by creating changes that can improve their life. Patricia Lee, right next to me here, has been a deputy public defender in San Francisco. Well, she said three decades, but she doesn't want you to believe it. She, she is the managing attorney for the Juvenile Justice Unit of the Public Defender's Office. She is also on the Family and Juvenile Law Advisory Committee of the Judicial Council. Joy Jackson Morgan. Joy Jackson Morgan on that end down there. Joy is the executive director of the Third Street Youth Clinic and Center. Joy's most important contribution to Third Street has been her ability to combine insight into the history of this neighborhood with both her formal education and her public health and professional experience. And being from the Bayview, we expect her to help us speak for you. Lauren Cherry. Lauren Cherry has held several educational and administrative positions in policy and design uh, jobs in her life. I'll call it a job, even though we'd, we'd like to say the word professional. She works for the Oakland Unified School District. She currently manages multiple aspects of attendance and discipline pro processing within the district. It is her job when a student must leave school and is expelled to evaluate the fairness, the equality, and the attention that student has been given before receiving such a directive. And I think I have, nope, did I miss somebody? I'm just going so fast. We have seen so much, heard so much, and if you, like me, you felt so much. You couldn't help but feel it if you care about children, if you care about humanity, if you care about life. And that's why these people on the stage tonight is going to help us deepen our understanding of our emotions, just like the children that our good doctor talked about. We hide all of these things that make us who we are. Most of them good, but many of them not so good. And so we're going to explore that. There was a line in there that says, somebody has to do something about it, somebody said. Or will we do something about it? I like that better. And that's what we're going to talk about as we explore um, the deep meaning behind this motion picture. So let's start with, you started as a pediatrician wanting to improve just the health of youngsters. But you found it was much deeper than that. And you, can you talk about the growth for yourself along this journey to explore? This process for me, I didn't learn about adverse childhood experiences or toxic stress in medical school or residency or even in public health school. And I went to great institutions. Um, I learned about it from my patients. And I'm looking at some faces in the audience right now uh, because uh, for me, I came here to try, uh, because I believed that every child deserves an equal opportunity to grow up healthy. And um, I wanted to give my, the best of myself, my training, my expertise, my time, my energy, and my passion here to the Baby Hunters Point community. And uh, what I found was that when I did that, this community gave me so much um, such an education, such an incredibly warm welcome, 
And then we, together, what we learned here, we were able to lift it up so that we can help kids all over the country and, in fact, around the world. Uh, and that feels really powerful. So um, that, that's been, it's been a transformative experience for me. I can't describe what it's been like. I would just like you to add a little bit more of what came out in the film. And that was about the emotional, the physical you came in to look for. You discovered the deepness of the emotional trauma. Yeah, I mean, I think what was very interesting for me was um, when I went to, uh, when, when I trained in pediatrics, uh, you know, what we were taught was, um, you know, we take care of the body and that if a child has an emotional problem or a behavior problem, uh, we'll refer them to our, uh, you know, someone else, um, you know, a mental health colleague or um, uh, someone else. And as we heard Dr. Victor Carrion say in the film, the, the, we separate that. The body doesn't separate that. The body is one. And that was a big part of the reason why we created the Center for Youth Wellness was to be able to um, bring all of these surfaces, surf services in one place under one roof and have us work in an interdisciplinary manner so that we could be, put the patient at the center and instead of saying, okay, this is my problem and that's your problem, to really say, how do we look at the whole child and how do we bring all of the services that are necessary to help this whole child thrive? I think um, as we move down the panel and, and involve the people here from their point of expertise, you spent a lot of your time in discovery, whereas Lauren Cherry spent a lot of her time in trying to cope. So you deal with students who have been missed by the wonderful information and maybe the help that could have been given at this level. You see them at another point, Lauren. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up. As educators, we're now having to shift our mindsets um, and perspectives and our practices um, in the classroom such that we, as, as Dr. Nadine talked about, looking at the whole child, we want every child to succeed academically, but also to succeed socially, emotionally, um, and their whole space. So as she has patients, we have students, um, they're really one and the same. And so it's really about having this conversation, this collaborative, this, this interdisciplinary concept and conversation around coordinating of services so that we can help that same student, that same family. And after that, so now we've got the discovery of health problems and how they tie into the emotional problems, and then we see what challenges this present to those who are trying to move children from whatever level they may have come from, no matter where that is, but to a higher point, and mostly to stay out of the difficulty with the authority figures. So we're going to explore that some more, but we'll talk about what happens when it fails and how that impacts upon, hopefully, will be stopped if we ever solve the problem that the good doctor is attacking. Did we talk with you and about juvenile justice? Yes. Can you hear me? No. no. Did you? All right. I, I have this on, but I'm, I'm known for having a very loud voice. Uh, <laughs> and I've been told to get off the soapbox by uh, various <laughs> judges in my, in my career. Um, I don't like to think of the justice system as a failure because every child that we work with has the opportunity to succeed. And if, if I didn't believe that, I should turn in my card. So unfortunately, I believe that the justice system is a trigger. It is inherently traumatic. It is an ACE factor. Mm. Um, most of the youth that come through the front gates of detention, and generally it is lockup, are youth of color. The majority are African American, 
at least 40 percent. 30 percent Latino. Asian Pacific Islander is a growing population. And once you get into that juvenile justice center, it is very difficult to find your way out. And it has always been by my belief and my passion, and that's why I keep doing this, and I expect to go another two decades, if you'll allow me, is that by the time that youth and family, if there is family, find themselves within the four walls of the courtroom, it is almost too late. And I think that our solution, and this is something I, based on our Be Magic program that we um, started in the Bayview because we wanted, <laughs> uh, we wanted to be a part of the community. We wanted to have the families trust us and to work with us. And it's, it's not only defending that case, but it's having a child-focused and a family-focused representation. So we don't just defend in court. We are out in the community, and we have grown our social work staff so that we have a girls' youth advocate to work with gender-specific issues and to be able to do outreach and to work with our trafficked girls who come in to the system and are so damaged. Um, we, we have a, an African-American social worker who goes all over San Francisco and beyond San Francisco and has established such a strong relationship with our youth. And unfortunately today, right before I came, one of our um, youth, 17 years old, came to court. He got in a big argument with his dad and he totally lost it. He has been very suicidal in the past, and he ran off. And my social worker went to his house and brought him back, along with the um, counselor with the behavioral health team, because he was at such great risk. He was so at risk in harming himself that we had to call 911. And there was an assessment done and they decided that he had stabilized with the help of the team. And the team was not just with our office, but with the, the mental health counselors, uh, with the probation officer who had great experience working um, it, with um, uh, children with severe disabilities and so we, we stabilized him, he left, he came back, and the sheriffs called and said, you have to come, you have to leave your meeting right now. Come, this is an emergency, please work with him. So the team wrapped, we wrapped our arms around this youth, and even when I left, he was still there in the building with my team, and I will tell you that I know that my social worker escorted him back home and he will be there tomorrow. So this is what we do. It's beyond the courtroom. It's embracing the community. Thank you. Doing a documentary like this sometimes takes a lifetime. I don't know how long it's taken you. And, uh, but I wonder what you think when you look at what you put on the screen, and that was real lives, mostly smaller children. That's one of the reasons I went to the other end of the spectrum before I got to you, because you told us so much about what was going on with them. Your comments about after having done all this, given us all this information as to what have we done with it? Well, um, uh, so, if, if you don't mind, if I could just take 10 seconds to acknowledge the te my team from KPJR Films that are here, mm -hmm. because they, none of this could have happened without them. Mm -hmm. My co-collaborator, writer, editor, Jen Bradwell, please stand up and just say hello. who's probably more responsible than anyone of getting this movie not only around the country but around the world. 
So thank you. So when the first time uh, that we looked at the ACES study, there were just a handful of schools that were trying to incorporate the science into their practices. Uh, there were just a handful of clinics, notably Nadine's. Um, and in the four years since I first read the study, uh, it's remarkable how much it's grown. So what I've seen just in the time of starting the film um, and what's going on now is extraordinary. There's um, so many school distri districts that are now calling themselves trauma-informed. The state of Utah uh, just passed state legislation saying that they uh, consider themselves a trauma-informed state and put designated money in the state budget to support that claim. Um, and so you see the, these things are changing. The patterns that I see is it starts with remarkable individuals, truly special people, um, and uh, others that have carried the movement that are in the film. And then the community starts to grab onto it, and uh, the nonprofits, the, the faith-based communities, um, the public sector in each community, and then slowly but surely things build. And I think eventually, uh, in, spite of, uh, in spite of what it looks like right now, uh, perhaps the, the federal government will, will kick in at some point in the future. So I have and a, any cynicism available to you right, right now I, coming from No, you. I mean, I think the wonderful thing is that the things I see that are so inspiring are happening in our own communities, in our own cities, uh, in, in our own ways. And uh, each community that I've been in that has embraced this, uh, I, I see this thing that Nadine describes, which is the importance of becoming holistic and getting everyone working together in pediatrics, education, juvenile courts, law enforcement, um, and working with each other because they're basically trying to do the same thing in, in, in their own unique ways. So I, I feel hopeful. Obviously, the broader, the, the broader issues, the, the underlying stressors um, that are just so stubborn and consistent, um, rates of poverty, joblessness, inequity, uh, you know, uh, gender inequities, economic inequities, those are the things that, you know, they have to be dealt with. Um, but at least in the interim, as these inequities continue to create so much trouble, there are tools for people to actually survive them. And it's people up here on the stage that, that can do that. So I'm just glad to be up here. Great, great. And I guess, would you say you're still in a learning experience with this I'm at all? Sorry? You're still in a learning experience with this? Are you learning something new? Have things moved to the back? I would say, well, learning, I would say inspiring. I mean, I, every time, you know, I've, I've, been, um, I've, been to the, I've been to Columbia. I've talked with people that see this issue through the lens of what does it mean to have kids who've, been, who've grown up in the middle of a war. Um, the war is coming to a close, but these kids know nothing other than either killing or being being shot at, um, and I've, I've seen the, the, the strength it takes for people to come together and prepare to deal with that. I've, I was in Kazakhstan last October, um, where the, the, the cultural pressures there are that there, there are simply no problems. Nobody has problems in Kazakhstan. And that is, uh, you know, to, to try and, and, and deal with the reality of what is the universal human condition in a culture in which it's best not talked about, it has its own unique. And to see people providing for kids and finding ways to, to do the kinds of things that everybody up here is doing in spite of a top-down approach, which is that everything's fine. And so, you know, I'm just inspired. I, it, so it's learning, but it, for me, it's just so awesome. To see. So, Doctor, you, you started wanting to deal with childhood illnesses. You've been along, around long enough with some of your childhood friends to become teens by now. Before we hear from the two young people here, let's talk about what it was like to nurture some of those young minds and got their bodies well, and then you found there were lots of other things that were coming into your view. Well, there's one, there's, um, there's one piece about um, what you just said in terms of um, you know, nurturing their bodies and then seeing what's happening um, with their minds. And th there's, there's one really, really powerful thing that if there's one thing I want to leave for this audience, is an understanding that this science gives us additional tools to understand what's going on. So for example, I say to a lot of my um, teenagers 
because of what you've experienced, your body actually makes more stress hormones than the average person. And that can look and feel like having trouble controlling your impulses or being quick to anger or getting sick easily when you feel overwhelmed. And I will tell you the number one thing that my kids say to me is, you mean I'm not crazy? Mm. They think it's their mind. They think that it's what's going on in their mind. But the brain and body are connected. And when a child has experienced very high doses of adversity and their bodies are making more stress hormones, mm -hmm. if we don't know what to do about that, if we don't teach kids that there are ways to calm their bodies down, if the, we don't teach kids that, if we don't teach, for example, school systems, when that kid in front of you is activated, they got huge levels of adrenaline and cortisol. Give them 30 minutes, just let them sit down, cool it off, let those hormonal levels drop down. If we don't, when we understand the biology, we can use this knowledge of the biology to help all of our systems function better, right? Not just, and, and I see this on the individual level. I have a young patient um, who we started caring for when he was, um, gosh, I think he was maybe 12. And, um, and he did really well. And he went off to college, he's going to Boston University. And he came back for his one last visit with his pediatrician, you know, after his first summer at college. And I saw him, and I said, how's it going? It's great to see you. he's doing fantastic, playing basketball, he's doing well academically. And being back with his family, there's some of the same family dynamics that are really difficult for him. And, you know, he had an A score of six. And I said, hey, you know, do you, do you notice this in your body? Do you... Uh, that your body you know, releases these stress hormones. And he says, you know what? I notice I get hot quick, right? And he, and we just talked about, we just figured out what are the things that he needs to do when he gets hot to just cool himself down. And he noticed what makes him hot, right? Being in the situation where certain family members, right, make him hot. And so he figures out how to manage those situations. And he knows when he's in a relationship, if he's in a healthy relationship with someone who's support, supportive, right, and nurturing, versus what happens when he's in a relationship with someone who may or may not have their own aces, most likely, I mean, every, we, we all do, right? So, you know, and what, how they navigate that when, when she's triggered, right? Those concrete tools, I think, are the absolute most critical things that comes out of us understanding this information. Which is, you know, what do we do and how do we interrupt that intergenerational cycle? Mm -hmm. How do we make a choice, a different choice for ourselves, a million different choices every day so that our kids do not have the same A scores that our generation does. Mm. Mm. Right. Tiffany, I think it was you that I read where your studies include examining and understanding students who are searching for love and hope. Yes. Oh, my mic is on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I didn't put that in my bio, but I'm glad that... Um, made it. I think I, as a teacher at Leadership High School, uh, we carry a, a, both the ethnic studies model, but also we incorporate what uh, Nancy Krieger, epidemiologist uh, Nancy Krieger identifies as an eco-social model, where we're not just looking at, um, we're, we're transcending the blaming of children for what they're experiencing, um, but we're also taking a little bit step, uh, another step further then from what uh, neuroscientists, when they're asking what has happened to you, we're also seeking to understand who and what is responsible for what's happening to you. So if our young people are um, experiencing pattern forms of uh, stressors or chronic, chronic stress, who and what is responsible for that? 
whether it's their poverty that we have control over, um, whether it's the racism and discrimination that they're experiencing, we seek to give young people the tools to investigate the causes of their stressors, um, but also giving them the tools to disrupt them. In what we found um, uh, by a study of, uh, from Arlene Geronimus, she looked at weathering on people's bodies, the wear and tear, and that some of the most successful people, black women in our society with high incomes and uh, great degrees, these women are still having high rates of infant mortality. They're, they're dying early. And so we have to even be careful with our honoring and praising of young people who, are, who have high achievement in the midst of adversity because the discrimination, the adversity that they're experiencing in our society still is wearing and tearing on their bodies. And so our models, our ethnic studies models, our eco-social models are looking at ending the causes of the discrimination because what we know about, there's one thing to have exposure to trauma, but we also have to have conversations around the ways in which our young people embody trauma, the ways in which the inequality and the discrimination that they experience literally gets under their skin. Right? And so we both are giving young people the tools to critically investigate it, um, to disrupt it, but we're also very, it's a lot happening while I'm preaching. Um, <laughs> but we also are seeking to gain partnerships with the most powerful in our society in that uh, we tend to often expect the most from those with the least power. And so we, while we give our young people the critical tools to investigate their lived experiences, we also are seeking to speak truth to power and expect much from those who have the ability to actually disrupt these causes of their trauma. Well. I like hearing from you because you're involved in that is, can, or, well, is anybody doing something about it? That's part of the answer to that question. So let's turn to another end of the table. Where is anybody doing something about it? And apparently from the applause out here, you might be that person. <laughs> well, that, that was appropriate, and I thank you all for that, because Third Street started off as the Bayview Healing Arts. How many people remember that in here? And I thank you, because it started as a community effort, right? So we are known as the most resilient neighborhood in San Francisco, right? Thank you, okay, yes, mm -hmm. right? And it started, Third Street started in 2005 as a community effort and an effort amongst young people. So like she was just saying, really trying to empower young people to take ownership of what's happening to them. And when the community came together, we said, we want a safe space for young people to just explore some of the loss that they're experiencing, explore some of the grief, um, some of the anger around the violence that's going on and express it in a, a healthier way. So we started off as using art as a healing modality. And then young people said, you know what? We need some health services. We need something where we can come in and get checked out for um, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, and so then we started the clinic side of it, right? Again, this was from the word of the community and the word of the, the young people. Um, we also added be behavioral health services, so we always had like a therapist um, on staff. And one of the things that we continue to see is that youth are experiencing grief but don't know how to deal with it, right? Because it happens so often. So the day that they go and get that placard or that t-shirt for one of their friends who was killed, the next week somebody else, they gotta go get another t-shirt, another placard, right? And how do we see this playing into our, our part, right? We screen all of our young people. They're using drugs, right? There's a, a high amount of self-medication. They're also using sex as a way for self-medicating. We see when um, violence increases, we see a, a spike in our STDs. So how do we give them the tools that they need, like she was speaking about, to, to process these things, right? One being that we give them their space, but the other part is the education part and letting them know that it's okay that, that you're going through this, but it's not okay, right? We're trying to help you get through this and that it, it's, it's not natural. So how do we, how do we continue to, to build up a community that continues to get broken down day after day, week after week? 
it starts here. It starts with these community efforts of speaking out, speaking out, listening to our young people about what they need to heal. You know, I'm gonna... Uh, pass the mic back down to James there for a second. Because when we looked at the, at, at the film, a lot of the places where you went were small town America. We're now in an urban center for the problems she's describing, are seem, seemingly the same kind of problems those people were describing and confronting. What's happening? Oh, boy, I, I <laughs> wish I had the answer. I could fix a lot of problems. You, you but, you would know, be on the stage. I, it is, it is um, it, the interesting thing about this science, and I think what I like about the fact that the, when you take, when you administer the ACE test, it's, it's, it's more important to understand what the exposure is as a number or frequency or, or how, how many of these generalized uh, experiences you've been exposed to, it creates sort of a safe, a safe zone because you can, you can say, oh, six is a lot, you know, two isn't great, but six is tough and you know the higher up it goes, the, the, the more there is the risk over someone's life of, of there being problems if it's not uh, mitigated. So that's an equalizer. So when you're in, you know, whether, you know, I, I, another interesting community, I was uh, with the Navajo Nation um, in September, then, you know, the interesting that you, thing you see there is they look at what you're talking about in terms of the value of community coming together and looking at the child as a holistic being that, that needs help in, uh, at many different layers, family, education, help, uh, that's built into their own spiritual practice that goes back forever. So, you know, they, they could recognize the science and say, wait, this actually looks like our own spiritual practice. So, in, in, when I go to the different places, it seems like you know, the good news is that there's a, there's a unique way for each community to attach to the science and, and use it to help themselves. Um, the bad news is this, it seems to be uh, the ACE scores and the, and the problems are prevalent everywhere. I mean, I've never gone anywhere where, you know, uh, people don't stand up afterwards who've hosted a screening, whatever, whatever community, and, and hear stories that, you know, break your heart. And, make you hope the best and, and, you know, hope that they can get the wraparound services they deserve. Patricia, you were, uh, rightly so, proud of the job that you're doing now. In a bureaucracy like this, you have time to digest the findings, you know, the doctor here, or the findings that were coming from, you know, a wonderful vehicle like this documentary. Does it get into the workplace psychology that people are doing these things? Actually, I was thinking of asking you, uh, the experts here, whether in your experience in your travels across the country and across the world, systems are actually implementing the use of the ACE in order to determine the risk factors, but also to link to the appropriate resources and services. Because I can tell you right now, that is not happening. Uh, there is not an ACE um, tool that is being used. There's a number of other assessments that are being used that are very lengthy, but this is a very simple and meaningful tool that seems to have yield good results. Um, and I would like to actually think about um, requesting that my social workers, when they're working with the families and, and talking to our children, uh, to our clients, that we start probing a little bit more. And of course you have to develop that relationship, but I, I know that I became acquainted with the ACE when a couple of years ago, one of our judges had the brochure from the clinic and she said, this is really great. We really need to implement that. Well, it's two years later, and I really appreciate you having this film because it is a power, powerful testament to justice stakeholders and system stakeholders to consider using this. I mean, we pay millions of dollars for these assessment tools, and I question how effective they are. 
Hey, Lauren, you're on the other side of the bay, but confronting the same kind of problems. You just don't have a good doctor on your team over there like we have over here. But uh, tell us about, you know, what are you all learning from what's being discovered, either through the film and the ACE or through her own personal experiences here? I can certainly imagine um, if our principals and our superintendents started um, the year off by showing this film, what a difference it might make in terms of adding it to our toolkit, um, looking at social emotional learning. Um, I've heard some of the panels talk about reaching students and families, talking about how to teach them to be self-aware, um, to be uh, able to manage their own emotions, um, looking at social awareness, uh, being responsible and making responsible decision making. You know, all of these kinds of stresses and um, triggers are not only with adults uh, or with children, but they're adult to adult. So when we talk about um, Oakland Unified School District, and I dare say San Francisco School District as well, um, looking at teaching different kinds of trauma-informed practices, looking at uh, restorative justice kinds of um, programs when we're making other decisions regardless or instead of being more punitive to our students, instead of suspending students for behaviors, really beginning to coordinate services so that we can look at what the root cause of. Um, California has eliminated, as many of you may or may not know, uh, but suspending students for defiance. So if I tell a student to sit in the red chair and he sits in the blue chair, I can no longer suspend a student for that. But trying to really reach down and understand why is it that the student wants to sit in the red chair instead of the blue chair. Maybe he, wants to sit, he or she wants to sit in the red chair because it sparks some kind of a memory, some kind of a trauma that happened. So as we as educators begin to look at routines and rituals and creating safe uh, cultures and environments, we have to really sometimes forego the academic and really look at the heart, look at the student, and take that time and be intentional about that time to really build relationships with students and with their families so that as we know that they may have suffered some kind of a trauma, we can help them through grief and recognize that maybe the elementary school student or the preschool student that is crying, that um, is suffering from um, an, an illness, that we can begin to make home visits and really recognize and understand and interrupt patterns of chronic absenteeism um, and do that kind of work. It's hard work, but it begins right here. Every person in there, you may have a child, you may have a godchild, you may have a, a sibling. Um, we all want the best for our children, both academically, socially, emotionally, and health-wise. And so for us to have this conversation, for us to be in this space, it makes a difference. So Oakland uh, and San Francisco, we're on the right path because we're doing the hard work. We're having the hard conversations. We're talking about race, class, and culture, and we're making some positive steps. So I can envision having this shown to superintendents all over the nation. It's a movement that needs to be done. I know that you've seen this film. You're in this film. Does it inspire you each time, or do you sit and you look at it and say, God, I thought they would have done something by this by now? <laughs> um, no, and it, it, it inspires me uh, profoundly. And I have to say that I'm incredibly uh, grateful uh, that Jamie called me and harassed me and uh, <laughs> uh, it included me in this amazing film. Um, and what I see is, I think for a lot of us, uh, change feels slow. Um, and it's certainly not fast enough for me. And at the same time, when the Bayview Child Health Center opened 10 years ago now, in March of 2007, no one had ever heard of this. I would talk about adverse childhood experiences and toxic risk. No one knew what the heck I was talking about, right? And then I think it was right after we opened the Center for Youth Wellness, maybe uh, it was probably about three or four years ago, I had Superintendent Carranza talking about adverse childhood experiences, how they affect learning, and as part of the My Brother's Keeper effort here in San Francisco, talking about how we need to be addressing those issues. That happened in a very short period of time. And I definitely see this happening 
not only here, because I really feel like for me, this movement, you know, this was the place that it grew out of. Um, but I just can't, I, I, I went and uh, they had a Know Your Aces conference in Jamaica. They, I was just in Montenegro, Eastern Europe, which is right between Bosnia and Serbia. And they had a whole national conference on adverse childhood experiences. And it was the same thing. People there are just like, oh, bad things don't happen to children here, right? And meanwhile, they've been in conflict and war and you know all this kind of things for uh, a long period of time. And um, it's really amazing to see what is happening. We are raising awareness. And now we need to go from awareness to action. So we need to change our policies and practices. We need to begin screening every single child for adverse childhood experiences as part of their regular physical exam. We need to be coordinating services between the doctor's office, the school system, our justice system, our early childhood system, all of our child serving systems that we have, we need to begin putting those policies and practices in place so that when our next generation of kids come through, they are having different experiences. And it comes from training every child serving practitioner. It comes from putting, looking within our own institutions. It comes from talking to your neighbor, putting it on your Facebook. If you got a Twitter, you got Snapchat, whatever you got. Put that information out there because when we know better, we can do better. We're gonna, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna excuse her right now. And, and, and you two young people, just, I don't need a mic. You two young people, it's in your court now. You guys with the dreams haven't been stomped on yet. <laughs> so I wanna talk both to you, Tiffany, and to you, Joy, we want you to take the last moments that we have for this panel. And remember, we can only take a few questions, so get them in right away. So who want to start? You want to start? Either one of you? Well, I can... Hello? Okay. Mm -hmm. I can say that um, we at Third Street have been providing mental health first aid trainings for several community-based organizations, and we've reached out to several schools to try to do this with their staff, because we feel like like Nadine was saying, if we start training the frontline people, then our kids won't have to go through what they go through at school, in the justice system, and so we are an open partner. Again, like Lauren was saying, it starts here tonight with us, it starts with this panel, and we're a partner in this. Um, I think part of our work, it follows a model of um, Antonio Gramsci in, in looking at a war of position uh, to eventually lead to a war of maneuver. And uh, much of this, the, most, the, the data in the film and the reality that young people are suffering, you know, Tupac talked about it a while ago when he said thug life. He said the hate that you give little infants, everyone. It's an acronym. And so we know that. We know that that investment in, uh, investments in, in uh, the demise of young people, it, it, it ruins a nation. We know that. We also know that if these numbers were happening uh, in the marina, in the sunset, in Piedmont, that we would have moved to action a while ago. We know that there's a direct correlation between who it's happening to and, and skin tone and class. We know these things. Um, and so what is more interesting for us in our generation who are in the streets, who are putting our lives and our bodies on the line, is closing the know and do gap. We know this is harmful, and so we have to think about, this relies upon a moral conscience. Knowing these numbers, right, and, and I particularly work in schools that, in schools, particularly in those spaces, to be successful, you have actually had to do away with a moral conscience. You have had to allow the harmful impacts of tracking and underachievement as a means for upward mobility. And we seek to disrupt those things. We're seeking to train up and love young people and provide hope for young people who will be courageous, who will sacrifice their bodies, their professions, um, their aspirations for those in their community, those that they love, those that they care about, and that they will develop what um, Bruce Perry gets at, what many practitioners 
are pushing for, which is empathy, our ability to love, our ability to respond to suffering. And so much of our pedagogy and much of our practices, both, as I said earlier, are seeking to address the causes of suffering, the causes of pain, but we're also seeking to love on young people in a way in which they seek to disrupt it. Last words, anybody, before I take a few questions here? Okay, if not, we'll close your head. What is being done to target upstream factors that predisposes communities to the ACEs problems? Anybody want to tackle that? Or have we answered it? I, hmm? I can. I think I went ahead of myself. But part of what I was talking about with uh, Antonio Gramsci's model of a uh, war of position is we're seeking to, often we, we talk about dealing with trauma and, and academic achievement as a false binary and that we need to address one or the other. And what we know is when you love young people and you uh, love on young people, then uh, academic achievement follows closely. And in order to address these, I really appreciate that question on upstream factors because sometimes when we talk about trauma, we center it around what's happening in homes and it becomes pathologized and we're talking about indiv individual behavior rather than structures that are causing bad health and bad health outcomes. And so through this war of position, we're seeking to create, again, to cultivate young people who will be in positions of power to make very important decisions that impact structures that deal with the ways in which structures produce um, inequitable health outcomes. Um, we're, most of the questions have been answered <laughs> as we've got, but there is one here that says, are there mi any Mrs. Kendra's programs uh, in the Bay Area, any Bay Area school that you can think of? And if not, have you advocated directly and bought your film to the doorsteps of school departments and said, go for it? Uh, so the post-traumatic stress clinic of New Haven, uh, Dr. Johnson's program, uh, when we were filming there, they were really focused on, on New Haven as the community of focus. Uh, they are preparing to take their program statewide in Connecticut. His goal is to go national. Uh, he struggles to raise money. Surprise, surprise. And, uh, you know, they, they're working on how to, to sort of export it in a way it's sort of like I think of it, you know how In-N-Out burgers are so good, right? Mm -hmm. So it's because everything's kind of local and, you know, it doesn't get turned into a, a sort of a, a monotonous uh, sort of tool to distribute around the world and it loses everything unique about it. Dr. Johnson would say that, you know, the thing with Miss Kendra is that it takes, you know, you can, you, he could send around a kit to every school in the country, but it's, it's so much more about the relationships and understanding the underlying uh, trauma-informed nature in which you interact with kids. It takes a lot more than a, than a Miss Kendra in a box. So although he's focused on doing that, you know, he's, he's still evolving and he, f he feels like it needs to grow in the right way. Well, thank you. We see that we have a really great crowd that stayed with us to the end. I'd like to give you a little bit of introduction to those that were able to put this event on tonight. Um, my name is Angelique Tompkins. I am the co-chair of the San Francisco Lynx Health and Human Services. Here is my chair, Dr. Allison Metz. We also need glasses by this time. Okay, um, we, we do have the pleasure of standing with our Lynx sisters and our families, um, as well as our partners from the Center for Youth Wellness and the CYW Community Advisory Committee to acknowledge the contributions of our sponsors and supporters for helping us to bring such powerful programming to our community today. We appreciate Kaiser Permanente, longtime partner to the SF Lynx and CYW and the communities we share. Jim Illick from Kaiser Northern California Community Benefits Manager who never fails to answer our call. Supervisor Malia Cohen, advocate for District 10 and tireless voice for the people. The historical landmark and home to Bayview families, activists, artists, and culture, Bayview Opera House, Ruth Memorial Theater, and the supportive team led by Barbara Ockel, Executive Director. 
Within and beyond our community, we would not have brought this ACES journey to light, building insight and awareness for such critical matters impacting our families and youth without our moderator and link sister, Belva Davis. I'd like to invite all the panelists to the stage. Thank you, Link Belva. And our panelists, visionaries Dr. Nadine Burke Harris and James Redford. We have a token of appreciation for each, and we hope that this is something that will remind you of this day forever. Thank you. <laughs> Community advocates, Patricia Lee. <laughs> Tiffany Johnson. <laughs> Joy Jackson Morgan. <laughs> and our Link sister and our very own hidden figure, Lauren Cherry. We share our gratitude with you for your impactful work. And now for our closing. When last we stood in this forum in 2013, we presented The Waiting Room, stories of raw emotion related to the Affordable Care Act, commonly known as Obamacare a contemporary, ever-relevant health and human rights discourse which we continue to see played out in the bipartisan landscape. Today, our conversation of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress lends itself to beckon new champions to this public health threat for our children, our families and communities, and ultimately future generations. Today, whether you have viewed this moment in time Reflecting on the past or looking ahead, we remind you that you are central to taking the next step and empowerment, whether on behalf of yourself or for others. Our message is one of awareness and advocacy. Today does not end our conversation. San Francisco Link's work continues on behalf of Bayview Families and ACES Therapeutic Services in partnership with Center for Youth Wellness and support from 62 Candles, Keep the Music Playing, a memorial campaign to Irving Frank Tompkins, beloved Bayview husband and father, we've just completed a music therapy pilot, helping families to develop greater communication skills and strengthen their family bonds. On our journey to building healthy communities together, we invite you to stay abreast of our work in the community. We wish you health, wellness, and healing. We wish you resilience. Thank you and good night.